Welcome back. Um, this video is going to be pretty short, um, short and to the point. Uh, for the next few videos, what I'm going to do is going to break up uh, multiple components of, of biosignaling into um, individual small videos. Um, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at an enzyme called phospholipase C. Okay. Now, in the previous video, yes, I think it was the previous video, we looked at how you terminate a G-protein coupled response. And what I mentioned was that, um, uh, that well, we use adenylate cyclase as an example, but recall that it, the, the enzyme that we, that we um, that the G-protein alpha subunit activates metabotropically, it doesn't have to be adenylate cyclase. And I mentioned that in this video, in that video. Um, the other, another example of an enzyme that the alpha subunit can uh, can activate is phospholipase C. Okay. Now, what I'll say at this point is that the mechanisms up till the activation of phospholipase C are identical. Okay. So, in other words, we have an adrenergic receptor. We have to have um, the hormone of whatever type it is. We have to have the hormone bound to the receptor. Okay. And effectively what's going to happen is, you remember, you're going to have a guanosine nucleotide exchange factor, right? And that's going to catalyze the um, loss of GDP, and you're going to pick up a GTP, right, at the alpha subunit. And then the alpha subunit is going to move along the membrane, translocate along it, and with bound GTP, right, it's going to activate phospholipase C. And it's going to do so in an identical manner with respect to the way it did um, adenylate cyclase, right? However, phospholipase C is a different reaction for obvious reasons. First of all, it's a different enzyme. And phospholipase C substrate is drawn over here on the left, okay? At first thought, this may look like a fairly um, difficult uh, and complex molecule, but I think what you'll find is if you break it down, um, it's actually not too difficult, okay? So what I want you to notice is over here, okay, this part of the molecule right here, and actually, well, let me go ahead and define what the molecule is first off. This molecule is called PIP2, okay? PIP2 stands for phosphoinositol bisphosphate, okay? So let me write that. This stands for phospho, or excuse me, not, it stands for phosphatidyl, excuse me. Phosphatidyl inositol 4,5 bisphosphate, okay? So if you look at the inositol component, which is what I circled in green, okay, the 4,5, this is carbon number 4, and this is carbon number 5. So that's where the 4,5 bisphosphate comes from. And the actual phosphatidyl part is the, are these fatty acids, including this phosphate right here, okay? Now, you might say, oh, well, how do you memorize all of these um, fatty acids? Well, I think if you break that down, it'll make sense, okay? Um, at this position right here, this is, this is arachidonate. This is arachidonate, so we call it arachidonoyl, right? This is your arachidonoyl group. And over here, this is 18 carbons. If you counted them, this would be carbon 18. So this is a uh, steroyl. I think that's spelled correctly. Steroyl, okay? So effectively, you have um, an arachidonate and a steroate that are attached to um, the glycerol component. So the glycerol component is this right here, right? Here's your glycerol component, right? And then you have individual fatty acids. This, the, um, the one closest to the inositol is your arachidonoyl group, and the one most distal is your steroyl. Okay? And what I circled in green, that's effectively what's going to be cleaved off in the reaction of phospholipase C. Now, the mechanism of phospholipase C, while your teacher may not require you to know it, it's actually fairly interesting, and I want to do it now down here. Um, the reason I do this mechanism is that it's actually very interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw, um, I'm only going to draw the critical hydroxyl groups. Know these ones on the ring still exist, okay? Oops, wrong one. Um, so I have my phosphate here, right? Here's my phosphate, and I'm just going to put a generic R group here. That's, of course, that R group is, of course, all this business up here, the two fatty acids attached to the glycerol, right? And then remember that you have a hydroxyl group here, okay? Now, of course, actually, let me go ahead and do it just for, for correctness sake. So we have our phosphates and then these, okay? 
Now, the mechanism of phospholipase C is actually very interesting, okay? What we're going to have is we have a lone pair on this oxygen, and that's going to be the nucleophile. So normally when we look at lipases, um, we're usually dealing with triacylglycerols, okay? And those lipases act as through a serine hydrolase mechanism, okay? They're serine hydrolases. This is not a serine hydrolase, but what you're effectively going to get is this hydroxyl group is going to do a nucleophilic acyl substitution right here. You kick these electrons out, generate a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, then the electrons kick back down, and diacylglycerol is generated. So that R group, that R group we can define as being diacylglycerol, and we'll come back to that later. Okay? Now what you generate, you generate this strange intermediate, okay? And the intermediate looks something like this, okay? So I have my phosphate here, okay? Um, let me do it like this. Um, let me come back. So here's my phosphorus atom. There's that. And effectively what you get is something that looks like this. Again, it's very strange, right? So this one's going up. This is going down. This one's going up. And then we have everything. So now you have this phosphodiester bond. Now we have cyclic IP3. So this molecule is an intermediate, it's called cyclic IP3. And effectively what's gonna happen now is you're gonna get a water molecule that's allowed into the active site and it's gonna do a nucleophilic acyl substitution. So we have um, nucleophilic attack on the phosphorus, generation of a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, electrons kick back down, and your leaving group is this bond right here which comes out and abstracts a proton from solution, okay? And so what you generate is something that looks like this, and this is a very important structure to know, mainly because it is such an important uh, biosignaling molecule. So we get something that looks like this, okay? Phosphate at position one, and we have a phosphate at position four, a phosphate at position five, and then six does not have one, okay? This molecule is called inositol, inositol one, 4,5-tris phosphate, okay? Inositol 1,4,5-tris phosphate, it's usually just shortened to IP3, okay? But no, it's inositol 1,4,5-tris phosphate, and it itself is a very, very important biosignaling molecule. Now, what did we also generate? Well, we also generated um, a diacylglycerol. Let's come back to that very quickly just to draw the structure, okay? So what we get is we have a hydroxyl group here, Okay, um, we're going to get something that looks like this. So remember, we have our arachidonate group, right? So one, two, three, four, five. So we have our arachidonate group, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? And then we have we have our steroid group, right? So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Okay, so there is diacylglycerol, and the diacylglycerol that we're talking about here specifically, remember, is our arachidonal wheel, right, and then steroid wheel, right. That's our diacylglycerol. Now that's the second one we're going to come to. Um, the first one we're going to talk about in detail is IP3, and from now on I'll abbreviate it as IP3, but just know it's inositol 145 trisphosphate. Okay. Now, effectively, what's going to happen, uh, what's going to happen, if my mouse will work, what's going to happen is whenever we have our G-protein coupled receptor response, the alpha subunit with bound GTP, assuming we have a hormone present, is going to bind to and activate phospholipase C. So what we're going to get through this enzyme is we're going to get an intracellular rise in the concentration of IP3. Okay, IP3 is soluble, so it can go into the cytosol, okay? And IP3, okay, if I have my endoplasmic reticulum, okay, here's my ER, okay? Now, in the ER, you have these ionotropic calcium channels, okay? So we have a lot of calcium in the ER lumen, so here's a lot of calcium, right? There's a lot of calcium inside the lumen, okay? So there's a lot of calcium in the extracellular environment and also inside the ER, okay? Now you have these ionotropic, um, ionotropic calcium channels in the ER membrane, 
and the molecule that binds to them is IP3. So as you start to have an intracellular rise in IP3 concentration, IP3 comes here and binds to the receptor ionotropically. And so what happens is you get all this calcium that moves through the receptor and comes out into the cytosol. Okay? And we're going to come back to calcium function a lot later. Suffice to say for now, it's going to activate calcium binding proteins like calmodulin, calcineurin, things like that. Um, but for now, just understand that when IP3 rises in the cytosol, it's going to go to the ER, bind to ionotropic um, IP3 receptors, calcium channels in the membrane of the ER, and you're going to get a drastic and sharp rise in calcium ion concentration in the cytosol. Okay, and that calcium is going to act as a second messenger in a lot of mechanisms that we'll look at. Okay, in general, that's pretty much all you have to know about inositol trisphosphate, IP3, because in general, inositols in humans are not catabolized. Really, this is the main function of inositol. Okay, um, it's really just for this function. There are various other things, like, of course, it's in fatty acids, as we can see, it's in phosphatidyl, inos phosphatidyl groups, right? Um, like phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate, but in general, it's, this is the main function of inositol, it's IP3, okay? And that's its function, to bind to ER ionotropic receptors and cause intracellular calcium concentrations to rise, okay? Um, sorry, my voice cracked a little bit. Anyways, now we have our membrane, right? And what we also have to realize is that in the membrane, there are also... Um, in, in the membrane, realize that diacyl glycerol stays in there. Okay? Remember, look at the structure of diacyl glycerol. Let's come back to it. Do you think diacyl glycerol is polar or nonpolar? No, in general, it's very nonpolar. And the reason it's nonpolar is due to these groups, right? The arachidonal wheel and the steroid wheel group, right? Those tend to make most of the molecule very nonpolar. So diacylglycerol it will not go into the cytosol. Instead, it's going to hang out here in the membrane. Okay? So we're going to have some diacylglycerols here in the membrane. right? And it turns out that diacylglycerol is really good at hooking onto and activating an enzyme called protein kinase C. Okay? So what we're going to find is in the membrane, we're going to have something called PKC. Okay? That stands for protein kinase C. And diacylglycerol is going to bind it and hook with it in the membrane, okay? And so with protein kinase C, not only does it require diacylglycerol to become activated, but it also requires calcium, okay? So calcium technically is a cofactor for protein kinase C, okay? So you could sort of consider diacylglycerol as a coenzyme. Calcium is a cofactor, so you need it for activation, okay? Now... Protein kinase C is a serine, is a serine threonine kinase. So there are certain sequences, sequences of amino acids on proteins that are targets for protein kinase C, and we're not really concerned with what those sequences are, but suffice it to say protein kinase C specifically targets proteins that have serine and threonine and phosphorylates them. Okay, so if we have a protein here, so here's our protein. What's going to happen is um, it's going to specifically phosphorylate residues on it that are serine and threonine. So by saying this is an R group right here, if it's a hydrogen, then it's serine. And if it's a, a methyl group, then it's threonine. So the point is that um, protein kinase C has many, many, many um, protein targets for activation. But it's really just looking at consensus sequences that it's specific for, and it's specifically phosphorylating, um, it's phosphorylating serine or threonine residues, okay? And of course, like I said, there are many, many proteins that can activate protein, or there are many proteins that protein kinase C can activate. My benzodiazepines are starting to kick in right now, sorry. But um, there's many proteins that PKC can activate, but the whole point is that the activation of these proteins is going to lead to an intracellular uh, response, okay? And that's, of course, by binding of the hormone or the neurotransmitter to the receptor, okay? So let's do a quick, quick recap of what we've seen, okay? So we started with a mechanism that was identical to how G-protein-coupled receptors um, activated. And, and this is a G-protein-coupled receptor, right? We have a guanine nucleotide exchange factor that causes the binding of GTP to the alpha subunit of the G protein. That dissociates and activates this guy, protein, or excuse me, phospholipase C, right? 
phospholipase C becomes activated, and we saw the mechanism of how it works, right? You get this intramolecular um, nucleophilic acyl substitution. In other words, diacylglycerol is our leaving group, right? That was our, our glycerol with arachidonate, arachidonate and stearate, right? Then we have a hydrolase activity, right? This is the hydrolase activity of, of uh, phospholipase C, and of course that gen the first reaction generates cyclic IP3, but the actual last part of the mechanism generated, if this works, um, IP3, which is shown down here. Okay, and IP3 of course stands for inositol 1,4,5 trisphosphate. Again, this is the one position, this is the four position, and this is the five position. Positions two, three, and six do not possess phosphates. So this is IP3, and of course this is diacylglycerol down here. Okay, we have our arachidonoyl group and our steroidal group. This, of course, is a hydroxyl group. Okay, now um, once we generate IP3. Um, or once we activate phospholipase C, we're going to have a sharp increase in the cytosolic concentration of IP3. That's going to lead to IP3 binding at binding sites on ionotropic calcium channels in the ER membrane. And of course, calcium ions influx into the cytosol, and we get a sharp increase in calcium ion concentration in, um, in the cytosol. Now, calcium can bind to calcium binding proteins like calcineurin, calmodulin, um, things like that, um, calcinexin, things like that. But the point is that calcium is going to act as a second messenger and act to, act to um, activate other proteins. One of the proteins that uses calcium is the one we saw in the next mechanism, which was protein kinase C. The DAG that was generated, recall if we look at the structure of DAG, diacylglycerol, if you look, um, it's incredibly nonpolar. And so there are lots of components of it, like the arachidonate and the stearate, that are very nonpolar, hydrophobic. So this guy's going to want to hang out in the membrane, right? It's not going to leave the membrane. It's stuck in there. And so it's going to hook onto and activate protein kinase C, protein kinase C, PKC. Now, calcium is required as a cofactor for this, but you could sort of view diacylglycerol as a coenzyme. And then PKC is going to look for PKC consensus sequences on proteins. And it's going to um, phosphorylate specifically at serine and threonine residues. Okay. Now, one thing that's important to realize about protein kinase C that I didn't mention is that unlike protein kinase A, remember we looked at protein kinase A in a previous video. Remember that one was free to move throughout the cytosol, right? Um, it's free to move throughout the cytosol. In fact, it could enter the nucleus, right? But what you have to view protein kinase C is, is that it's pretty much confined to the membrane. And it's confined there because it has to have diacylglycerol to become activated. And, of course, DAG is confined to the membrane as well. Okay? So you have to have DAG so protein kinase C's activity is confined to the membrane. So cytosolic proteins have to come to the membrane to become activated. Uh, specifically, they're going to have to come to protein kinase C. Okay? So in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at calmodulin and how calmodulin kinases work um, and other things like that. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuitive sense about phospholipase C. See you in the next video.